Welcome back, Mitochondria. This is Dr. Peebler for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. So today I'd like to try to finish up with our micro series about vitamin D, talking about its unbelievable effects on cancer in particular, both for the prevention and treatment of cancer. In the last video, we left off on this slide right here, talking about how 125-hydroxy vitamin D regulates glutamine synthesis and uptake. But Today, we're gonna to be talking about glucose, glucose, and a little bit of HIF-1-alpha. So let's get into it. So the first paper I wanted to discuss is titled, Vitamin D is a Novel Regulator of Tumor Metabolism, Insights on Potential Mechanisms and Implications for Anti-Cancer Therapy. And what it says here is that the 125-hydroxy vitamin D, or calcitriol, or the activated form of vitamin D, the vitamin D that's been activated by both your liver and your kidneys, has been shown to possess significant anti-tumor potential. While most studies so far have focused on the ability of this molecule to influence the proliferation and apoptosis of cancer cells, more recent data indicate that that 125-hydroxy D3 also impacts energy utilization of tumor cells. In this article, we summarize and review the evidence that demonstrates the targeting of metabolic aberrations in cancer by 125-hydroxy vitamin D and highlight potential mechanisms through which these effects may be executed. And this is a somewhat busy slide on the right, but basically what it's showing is that vitamin D, in this paper we're talking about 125-hydroxy, not the inactive 25-hydroxy or the lumosterols or vitamin D3 analogs that we've talked about in prior videos, but we're talking about 125-hydroxy vitamin D. And it has multiple actions on glucose metabolism, as you'll see in later slides as well, but it has a direct impact on glycolysis. It's also going to have a direct influence on glucose import into the cell through glucose glucose transporters is going to have direct effects on AMP kinase. And we've talked about how that not only is responsible for blocking the activation of mTOR or the activity of mTOR, which is a key growth signal, but AMP kinase, when it's having low activity, also is a driver of pseudohypoxia through HIF-1-alpha. We see here that activated vitamin D also has activity on HIF-1-alpha directly and several of the key enzymes such as pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which is responsible for putting the brakes on PDH or pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which is responsible for the bottleneck that leads to excess lactate formation from pyruvate. We've talked about this in depth during the cancers and mitochondrial metabolic disease one, two, and three series, as well as some of the hypoxia inducible factor videos. But this is just a refresher. And it also shows the therapeutic implications of vitamin D on these various important pathways, which lead to the Warburg effect and the snowballing through various pathways. This is just another representation similar to what we saw with the glutamine video of how when we have red lettering, we see that the expression or the activity is decreased by the activated form of vitamin D. Or if it is highlighted red, that would show that the flux from those chemicals are decreased. And we see that GLUT1 in particular, a important glucose transporter that takes glucose from the circulation into the cells is significantly decreased. We also see that several key intermediates within glycolysis are decreased in terms of their pool size, 3PG, as well as pyruvate and lactate. And we see that another mechanism in which vitamin D is effective here is that it actually decreases the activity and expression of lactate dehydrogenase, which is important for the conversion of pyruvate to lactate, which that lactate is going to get shuttled outside the cell, create the acidic tumor microenvironment, which has so many negative implications in terms of our ability to use our immune system to overcome cancer. This is another important slide because it's going to show us how vitamin D directly affects AMP kinase and how that's going to have positive effects on growth pathways such as mTOR, and it's going to decrease the activity of transporters. It's going to decrease the glycolytic intermediates or the sugar breakdown products, and it's going to also take the break off of autophagy as well. It's going to help us decrease the synthesis of cholesterol and fatty acids. It's going to help us break down fatty acids, and it's going to help us with autophagy, as we talked about in prior videos, which can be helpful for cancer in some respects. It's going to also put the brakes on protein, lipid, and ribosomal biosynthesis, which is going to help basically shut down the replication and proliferation machinery that is necessary for cancer to have the uncontrolled growth that we know about. Now, I want to change gears here just for a second because we're going to talk about how the activated form of vitamin D, 125-hydroxy vitamin D, or in this case, it, it's using the other name for it, calcitriol, suppresses both HIF-1 and HIF-2, which are incredibly important proteins to be modulating in the context of cancer because these HIF proteins are what are basically abnormally signaling to the cell that there are 
is a need to hyper rely on glucose, which sets us up for the Warburg effect that we've talked about so many times in the past. And this paper is called Calcis Trial Suppresses HIF-1 and HIF-2 Transcriptional Activity by Reducing HIF-1 to Alpha Protein Levels via a VDR Independent Mechanism. I think this is a great place to take a pause and talk about how I've had a lot of comments talking about people who have VDR polymorphisms, people who have VDR mutations. And I want to reiterate that Number one, VDR mutations have nothing to do with vitamin D synthesis, okay? So getting it from the sun is still the best way to get vitamin D and vitamin D analogs. And the vitamin D receptor really has no role in that. Now, we've talked about how some of the vitamin D3 and L3 analogs, these non-classical vitamin D chemicals, which are bioactive, can actually increase expression of vitamin D receptors or the VDR, but in terms of the synthesis, there's really no relationship, okay? I want to make that exceedingly clear. That being said, I also want to reiterate another point that I talked about in the last video. Many of the actions of vitamin D have nothing to do with the vitamin D receptor. They have vitamin D receptor independent pathways in which they do not require a vitamin D receptor or translocation to the nucleus to have effects like a lot of other hormones do. So, in this paper, it says that on the basis of the acquired data, it can be proposed that calcitriol reduces HIF-1-alpha and HIF-2-alpha protein levels and inhibits HIF-1 and HIF-2 transcriptional activity by a VDR independent non-genomic, has nothing to do with the genome or the nucleus, mechanism that involves inhibition of PI3K, AKT signaling pathway, and suppression of HIF-1-alpha and EPAS-1 mRNA translocation. Basically, as we can see in this picture here, that vitamin D, without having any relationship to the vitamin D receptor, blocks several steps along this pathway, which is important for the activation of HIF-1-alpha, and it also helps in the destabilization of HIF-1-alpha as well. Remember, HIF-1-alpha under normal physiologic conditions with normal oxygen and without a significant pseudohypoxia or conditions that mimic hypoxia or low oxygen is going to get destabilized and it's going to get degraded by proteases in the cellular milieu. However, when HIF is actually stabilized, that's when it can lead to the effects that it has in driving this Warburg-like metabolism. So when we have calcitriol, calcitriol is blocking it at multiple levels along these pathways, ensuring that HIF-1 is going to be destabilized and not active, therefore continuing to drive the Warburg effect in cancer. And that's what it's showing here as well. Vitamin D and hypoxia points to an interplay in cancer and showing that it has effects on angiogenesis, invasion, metastases, proliferation, and inflammation, as well as apoptosis. Whatever HIF-1-alpha is doing, essentially vitamin D is doing the exact opposite because it's blocking that activity and enhancing the necessary inhibition of those processes to maximally affect cancer to our benefit. Welcome back, mitochondriacs. I'm back after a short intermission. Probably doesn't seem like I was gone, but uh, maybe you can see that the light has changed. I had to come back after a brief rainstorm down here in South Florida, and I didn't want to get my MacBook or my, my iPhone or my microphone wet. So now I'm back to talk about vitamin D and its effects on hypoxia-inducible factor alpha. And so as I was saying, basically calcitriol, as you can see, is blocking all of the mechanisms of which HIF-1 and 2 are working upon because it's blocking HIF-1 and 2 at multiple steps. And what I have not had a chance to do is, is read this here. On the contrary, tumors possess several adaptive mechanisms that enable them to evade the anti-cancer effects of calcitriol. Such maladaptive processes are characteristic of the cancer microenvironment, which in solid tumors is frequently hypoxic and elicits the overexpression of HIF's hypoxia-inducible factors. HIF-mediated signaling not only contributes to the cancer survival and proliferation, but confers resistance to anti-cancer agents, including conventional chemotherapeutic agents. Taking into consideration that calcitriol intertwines with signaling events elicited by hypoxia status cells, this review examines their interplay in cellular signaling to give the opportunity to better understand the relationship in cancer development and their prospect for the treatment of cancer. And I want to end on a couple of key points. I think it's fairly clear that calcitriol, vitamin D, activated vitamin D, as well as several of the inactive, quote unquote, vitamin D analogs that have biologic activities have profound effects on the Warburg effect as a whole. And that's what these two papers are talking about in the context of non-small cell lung cancer, as well as colorectal cancer or colon cancer.
And we've talked about that from now the glutamine and now not only glucose, but the actual driver of the Warburg effect, which is the hypoxia inducible factors and being able to basically shut down the various vicious cycles that are going on simultaneously through excess glycolysis, excess lactate formation, excess hypoxia and pseudo hypoxia signals, and the excess uptake and utilization of glutamine. And the evidence is mounting that this is definitely the Achilles heel of cancer as a whole, no matter what the cancer subtype or genetic aberrations that are either proceeding or happening after cancer has transformed. And vitamin D has an important role in shutting that process down. Okay, moving on. I'd like to, you know, end on this slide here. And the reason is because, you know, I want to talk about, you know, general recommendations. I think there's a lot of misinformation and maybe misunderstanding is a better word to say about how much vitamin D you need per day. And I've heard people giving blanket statements like 5,000 or 8,000 or 10,000 units per day or even 20,000 units per day. And while I think that there's probably for the most part, little harm by doing a higher end of that spectrum. It really should be done with a doctor you trust or a practitioner that you trust who's able to check your vitamin D levels on a fairly regular basis. We check something called the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. I mentioned that I think in the first video, and that is after the colcalciferol molecule, which is converted from 7 dehydrocholesterol, is captured in its storage form after being hydroxylated in the liver and converted to this 25 hydroxy vitamin D. That is the lab test that we check for the vast majority of people. Now, if you have significant renal function issues, renal failure, chronic kidney disease, God forbid, end-stage renal disease, then we may have to do some additional checking on you because when you have synthetic function of the renal parenchyma or the renal tissue that is damaged, you lose the ability to one hydroxylate vitamin D. So you cannot make the active form 125 hydroxy vitamin D or calcitriol. And in those patients, we may also additionally check 125 hydroxy vitamin D, the active form. And those patients may benefit from getting calcitriol from their nephrologist or from their respective doctor who manages this aspect of their healthcare. But for the majority of people, we're going to be checking the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And in the classic, you know, conventional medicine, anything above 30 is considered sufficient, 30 nanograms per milliliter. And for our purposes, I think it's safe to say that we probably want you somewhere between 60 and 80 nanograms per milliliter. And how much it will take person A may be different from how much it takes person B because there are other factors involved in synthesis of the cholesterol molecule to vitamin D. Effectively, there are things that can lower your ability to convert. And we can talk about that at later dates, but the bottom line is it will take different amounts of vitamin D intake via whether from the sun, whether it be from supplemental form, et cetera, to achieve the same goal level of vitamin D for different people. So I just want to kind of clarify that in some ways. I also want to say that if I had cancer personally, I would try to push my vitamin D level up as high as I possibly could without causing significant hypercalcemia or high calcium levels, which is a potential side effect of people who have elevated vitamin D levels. Now, I cannot say that people that I check vitamin D on, and I check a lot of vitamin D levels, have those elevated levels. Most people are deficient, to be honest with you. But I have seen a handful of people who have vitamin D levels that are above 100 nanograms per milliliter, which would be in this excessive quote unquote range, according to this. And I have not seen a definitive, you know, definite side effect of having hypercalcemia on a constant basis. It, I've seen it where people who have less than 100 have some degree of hypercalcemia. And that may be from other reasons, maybe hyperparathyroidism or some other reason, excess intake, lack of vitamin K2, et cetera. But that being said, you need to be checking this with your doctor and or healthcare practitioner on a regular basis. And like I said, if I had cancer, I would want my levels to be as high as I could tolerate it without causing any significant side effects. And that's going to take a relationship between you and your healthcare practitioner to decide what that level is for you. I want to highlight that the discussion on the comments has been fantastic. I've got some amazing questions and I've been very grateful to be able to, you know, with whatever knowledge that I have, impart to you in the comments and give you some guidance. That being said, there's a lot of misunderstanding of, you know, VDR polymorphisms and so on and so forth. And maybe we can do a video about the VDR polymorphisms in the future. Although I'd like to move on to other factors that affect the Warburg effect and cancer treatment, most notably melatonin being next, but we can talk about that in the future. I want to say that truly does feel, especially with the last couple of weeks, that we are building a community of like-minded individuals who want to be healthy, who want to reverse disease and use non-conventional means to do that. 
and I'm happy to be part of that journey and facilitate that discussion. And so I just thank you for your comments. It's been a lot of fun for me to participate. So this would be, as of right now, the end of the vitamin D micro series. It has been a nice journey to go through a lot of the benefits. There's no way that we've been able to cover all of the benefits that is imparted by vitamin D for a lot of other disease processes, but we have definitely hit a lot of the highlights and we've definitely hit its role in cancer prevention and treatment. And I hope you've appreciated the journey. We will be heading into the next micro series, which will be on melatonin. And before we go there, I want to tell you that melatonin is probably as awesome or more awesome than vitamin D, which is hard to believe and will be an exciting next part of the journey. I have got a lot of interest recently, a lot of emails on the Integra email about people who are interested in metabolic therapy. And I just want to say that as of right now, I only have a medical license in the state of Florida, so I can only practice medicine in the state of Florida. And so therefore, if you're interested in a consult, you'd have to be physically within the state of Florida. Now we can do a Zoom consult and you don't have to be necessarily in Fort Lauderdale or Miami where I live. But that being said, that's the only way I can do a physical consult with you legally. That being said, if you're interested in an educational consult, that's something I can do. I would not necessarily take you on as a patient, but I can give you kind of a high level and nitty gritty overview of metabolic therapy. And I'm willing to do that for anyone in the world. So just reach out via email and I'd be happy to get back to you. If you like these videos, please like, share, subscribe. We're going to be continuing to really hammer down all of the known glycolysis and glutamine and HIF-1 alpha inhibitors, lactate dehydrogenase inhibitors that are known within the literature, both medication drug and nutraceutical and supplemental forms of things that are known to have activity on these enzymes that can potentially help you and your doctor or your healthcare practitioner come up with a viable plan to implement and employ metabolic therapies for your health journey. Until next time.